welcome back to the lecture series on narrative mode and fiction. We are discussing features of the novel in the light of E. M. Foster's work, aspects of the novel. So, in the last lecture, we were talking about uh, fantasy and prophecy, the fantastic and uh, the prophetic elements that we find in the novel. Uh, as a continuation of the discussion, we need to understand that fantasy uh, involves uh, the unearthly. We were talking about the small gods that do not make large claims, that uh, do not come to transform us in a very big way, uh, but that uh, nonetheless uh, uh, illumine the narrative. Both uh, fantasy and uh, uh, prophecy are like uh, bars of light which do not show in the narrative, but which transform everything around it, right. So, uh, this small god of fantasy could be uh, hidden and lurking in the narrative, the demigod uh, or the supernatural being uh, has very, uh, you know, human like qualities and it still uh, uh, never ceases to amaze us by its presence. So, Fantastic uh, could be, in the words of E. M. Foster, I quote from the book, introduction of a god, ghost, angel, monkey, monster, migget, witch into ordinary life, or the introduction of ordinary men into no man's land, the future, the past, the interior of the earth, the fourth dimension or divings into and dividings of personality or finally the device of parody or adaptation." Unquote. Once again, he says uh, in another part of the work, fantasies uh, give us only the old story of the wishing ring which brings either misery or nothing at all. Unquote. So, these old stories could be related to the uh, Jungian idea of primordial image or uh, mythologian, the idea of primordial image that Carl Jung uh, conceives for the first time, which has a striking accord with uh, familiar mythological motives. So, the contents of uh, the primordial image uh, resonate with our collective unconscious and it is shaped by continually operative processes uh, such as learning, acculturation and experiences as well as certain inner determinants of psychic life. Carl Jung devises uh, the term archetype which traces its origin in the Greek language uh, meaning original pattern or model. And now, the tabular rasa theory claims that individuals are born without any intrinsic mental content such that knowledge comes only from experience and perception, uh, the processes, the experiences that we undergo after birth. The proponents of tabular rasa theory, uh, however, disagree with the uh, theory of innatism. So, innatism is another school which holds that mind is already in a position of a certain knowledge. Uh, Carl Jung uh, rejected the tabular rasa theory. He actually uh, favored the uh, theory of innatism. According to Jung, uh, while archetypes do lack a solid content, we are not born with some solid knowledge. Uh, however, we, our conscious is in a way blank, in a sense blank. We do have some, you know, a priori understandings or ideas or, or pictures, uh, images that we are uh, born with and they belong to the unconscious. Uh, so, so, this uh, unconscious forms an a priori substratum of our mind. So, archetype is the basic state common to all human minds upon which individuals build their own experience of life which ultimately uh, comprises the conscious layer of our psyche. And, and uh, so, the unconscious is uh, 
further colored with unique culture, personality, events and so on. E.M. Foster notes that fantasy could be about the uh, last of the witches that, uh, that wishes uh, decentralization from a scientific world, uh, that wishes to smash the world as it is and urges the magic ring holder to seek happiness, which is a wish that has not been made in the history of the ring. So, the true uh, fantasist makes the kingdom of magic merge with the commonplace world. Uh, author Norman Matson uses happy with forever. This is an impossibility. And so, his character says no to happy forever. While happy is the ordinary aspect of human desire and therefore uh, achievable uh, in a limited way. Happiness is achievable in a limited way. Forever is the fantastic side which evades human conditions of existence. Nothing is forever. Everything is in a state of flux. So, the archetype of the magic ring that constantly seeks happiness but is imperiled to slip into misery at any moment could also uh, be close to the Lacanian concept of joyance, joyance or neonatal bliss, uh, which we subsequently tend to lose. Uh, once we are introduced into the world of symbols and conventions, once we become uh, too, uh, you know, uh, too much uh, part of uh, the social self, the, the conventional self, uh, we tend to uh, uh, give up on our joyces. Joy so, fantasy could be seen as the uh, Lacanian real stage uh, where joyces uh, can be. Uh, uh, perceived uh, in its best uh, sense. So, Jacques Lacan uh, notes that the real is as such impossible. This is because the needs of the real stage cannot be expressed in language and once we make an entry into the world of language, into the world of conventions and symbols, uh, they mark our irrevocable uh, separation from the real. We are in a state of joyousness when we cannot, uh, you know, we are constantly needing and demanding, uh, but we do not have the equipment of the language uh, to kind of put in words what we want and what we demand, what we desire. Once we have language, uh, the joyousness is gone. So, uh, we, we do not demand anymore. We become a subject. It, our, our uh, our subject formation has already begun. So, uh, as our adult conditions constantly pushes away the real, um, recognizing the unachievable uh, premises of uh, the real stage, the joyces, causes us trauma. And uh, in fact, obsession or fixation with joyces leads to uh, what uh, Julia Kristeva would call uh, as the state of abject and melancholia. The fantasy is uh, similarly a chimera like the real stage or the state of joyousness. The fantasy tends to slip away constantly. It, it is uh, there but not quite. It is like a chimera. So, the fun charm and yet uh, profundity that are emanated by a good work of fantasy cannot be surpassed in beauty by a serious literature. The message that we can convey through, uh, you know, deploying fantastic elements cannot uh, be uh, quite conveyed through a serious piece of literature. Parody or adaptation uh, draw on a pre-existing tradition from where the creative artist identifies a pattern and takes a swing to gain strength. They apply their literary genius to revisit a literary tradition which acts as the stuff. However, it is important to note 
that fantasy and social satire are not always interchangeable. They are similar but not quite the same. And so drawing any parallels between the two could be a facile job. Uh, fa parody could draw on a musical, social, political institution and uh, erect a world of its own uh, based on imagination. Here we have in our mind uh, uh, James Joyce's Ulysses which is uh, uh, based on uh, Odyssey. So uh, through Ulysses, Joyce is inverting or rather subverting the Victorian values and drawing on an epic tradition in order to achieve it, right. He is drawing on, like I said, Homer's Odyssey. Joyce uh, deploys mythology for crafting a stage and characters uh, that address his own thoughts. In Ian e. Foster's words, uh, I quote, Ulysses aims uh, to quote Foster, to make crossness and dirt succeed where sweetness and light fail, a simplification of the human character in the interests of hell, unquote. So, Joyce's novel transposes from Ulysses's uh, sea voyage in Greece to the journey of an ordinary man in Dublin from morning to midnight. We trace uh, the duration of uh, an entire day in the life of this man, uh, which is defined by chaotic uh, mediocre tasks. So, Joyce's protagonist, Mr. Leopold Bloom, is a converted Jew. He is greedy, he is lascivious, timid, undignified, desultory, superficial and uh, he is always at its lowest when he pretends to aspire. He is anything but Ulysses. He tries to explore life uh, through the body, right. And uh, Penelope uh, is Mrs. Marion Bloom who is an extravagant uh, soprano. By, and by no means she is harsh to her suitors. So, uh, in, in uh, Homer's Odyssey, we see Penelope having a very, uh, the strength of character where she spurns her suitors. She is waiting for uh, her husband to come back after the journey. And here, Marion Bloom, a soprano, never spurns her suitors. She is never her, harsh to them, not by any means. Uh, then Stephen Dedalus from the portrait of the artist to the young man is worked into Ulysses which is an epic of dissolution. So uh, Stephen Dedalus who is uh, a protagonist in his earlier work portrait of the artist has been uh, you know kind of uh, mm, uh, uh, transplanted and uh, foisted in his uh, Ulysses. So Stephen Dedalus here becomes the spiritual son of Joyce's protagonist uh, Leopold Bloom uh, and he can be seen as parallel uh, to the character of Telemachus. Uh, critics uh, often read uh, Stephen as the literary alter ego of James Joyce himself and he also indirectly embodies aspects of Hamlet. So in Ulysses, in Joyce's Ulysses, intertextuality is brought in to show how the modern world uh, brings in uh, qualities or uh, features of epic. How can we uh, have an epic in the modern times, in the uh, debased uh, world, in, in, in the world with uh, you know debased values, diminished values, how can we uh, rework uh, epic, how can we work uh, you know Kunstel Roman for example uh, in the modern world. What happens uh, when the epic hero or the Kunstin Roman protagonist navigates into the modernist literary scape of early 20th century Ireland? Uh, so here we are talking about Dublin in 1904. So the aim is to show the degraded civilization, the debased form of art, life uh, and the infernal quality of life where um, sexes could interchange, personalities melt, orgy is joyless and there is, uh, simply put, there is no respite. Uh, 
he, we we have a uh, introduction of uh, leopold bloom in the story as follows i quote mr leopold bloom ate with relish the inner organs of beasts and fowls he liked thick giblet soup nutty gizzards a stuffed roast heart liver slices fried with crust crumbs fried hen coats rose but most of all he liked grilled mutton kidneys which gave to his palate a fine tang of faintly scented urine unquote a nauseating uh, you know feeling that the reader uh, is uh, so it's very fulsome it's very nauseating for the reader who is reading um, a description uh, such as this uh, it appeals to the senses uh, in a very uh, vulgar manner and in a very negative fashion it is it, it talks about sensory excesses um, uh, uh, you know uh, that are not at all pleasant for the reader to uh, uh, envision or uh, or fathom right so from here we are going to talk about uh, another work in the light of prophecy uh, jane eyre uh, can be read as a prophetic piece thomas langford notes that although apparently simple in structure jane eyre uh, by charlotte bronte contains a quality of imagination and insight which borders on the visionary and prophetic uh, a quality that is presented with sufficient uh, subtlety to condition the reader's response uh, almost imperceptibly. So, the narrative of Jane Eyre is informed by Charlotte Bronte's uh, power of imagination, which is reflected through uh, the protagonist Jane's prophetic vision. Presentiments sympathy and science add a mysterious texture to the novel sympathy baffles a uh, mortal comprehension especially the way it works among estranged relations right for example prophetic signs in the novel could be how the nature reciprocates uh, and uh, you know sympathizes with human emotions uh, Thomas Langford, once again, I quote him. Uh, he states, uh, From Jane's prophetic dreams just before her wedding day to the lightning blasted chestnut tree foreshadowing Rochester's tragedy to the telepathic call which comes to Jane at Marsh End, the reader is seldom free from the influence of these prophetic suggestions and revelations. Unquote. So, these prophetic suggestions these uh, you know uh, reciprocation between uh, human and outside nature human emotion and uh, natural uh, happenings uh, provide a continuity and uh, a unity to the novel the difference between prophecy and preaching is as follows so Preaching involves traditionally understood higher uh, discussions. It uh, involves God, question of sin, morality, pardon within the limited ambit of the mundane. Uh, and preaching uh, does not uh, really raise to another plane. On the other hand, prophecy links characters and situations to the infinite and this infinite reciprocates comes back to talk to the or speak to the ordinary so ordinary individual has the wing to take him to the extraordinary plane in the case of prophecy the greatness present in the message of a dream or prophecy cannot be uh, simply uh, delimited or arrested to the mundane alone so while the preacher is adequate and homogeneously uh, constructed and located in the moral and mythological world the prophetic characters mind uh, uh, somewhere dwindles between the frame of the ordinary and something that expands that outgrows the ordinary into something larger so 
which shows in the character's state of ecstasy and rapture. So, uh, ecstasy and rapture are, uh, you know, some of the uh, features of the prophetic character. Even as the prophetic character connects to the extraordinary plane, it is also immediately relatable and identifiable. Contrastively, a preacher's dreams do not take off from the center of reality. It is constantly making reality as its original point of reference. Such a dream tries to find a logical connection uh, to the reality and therefore can never be a song or a resonating sound. Uh, for example, uh, uh, a preachy voice or a preacher uh, does not talk of poetry or philosophy, but produces or tends to produce, aims to produce a singular meaning through uh, even through songs or uh, something magical. So, the aim is uh, to produce something prosaic, something singular and definitive. The prophetic writing has a bardic quality, the quality of a bard and um, sound becomes more important uh, than uh, words and thoughts. Uh, the musicality, the sound of the speech becomes more, uh, you know, prominent than what is being spoken, what is being thought. Uh, so, for example, George Eliot, as Ian e. Foster notes, in the capacity of a preacher, says uh, sympathetic things about dreams uh, and not something that is bizarre and uh, defiant of the common sense. Right. So, George Eliot uh, talks about uh, dreams, but he never defies or he never goes anti to common sense. That is where uh, he remains only a preacher and cannot become a prophet. He is not bizarre. He uh, does not uh, defy the commonsensical plane. Fyodor Dostoevsky can weave in a reality through description of uh, little things uh, and as a prophet, Dostoevsky offers a rough and yet a rich narrative surface to readers. Something that one cannot, uh, you know, take down in one go. Something that is uh, difficult to crack, but uh, which is richer nonetheless, which, which offers friction between, uh, you know, what we are, uh, uh, what we are uh, accustomed to uh, uh, read and uh, uh, what we are comfortable to read. Uh, so, it, it in a way challenges our comfort zone as a reader. That is the prophetic writing. It uh, uh, pushes us uh, to uh, move uh, beyond, move outside of our, uh, uh, you know, plane of or zone of uh, comfort. So, as D. H. Lawrence observes, uh, lacking the tone of sermons, uh, denunciation, or advice. Uh, the sweet tone of bullying on the part of the prophetic writer leads the reader to a sense of futility. The, just uh, the opposite in the case of uh, preaching. Preaching is more sincere, preaching is more limited and preaching leads to something, uh, you know, almost definite utilitarian, something one could apply in life and lead a very... Uh, uh, a happy life in the most ordinary and mediocre sense. Uh, but the sweet tone of bullying where, uh, you know, prophecy is not uh, giving away any immediate meaning uh, always uh, makes the reader land up on a sense of uh, futility, right? So, in order to enter and inhabit the world of prophecy, E.M. Foster asks the reader to shed uh, her presumptuous notions of possible, impossible, plausible, implausible and uh, also give up uh, to an extent the sense of humor uh, so that we do not laugh off or scoff at the author's prophetic vision. The prophetic vision is bizarre, like I said. We need, we ought not, uh, you know, to laugh at uh, such a vision. It requires of the reader 
much like in the case of uh, uh, the reader of uh, fantasy, uh, much like in the case of the reader of fantasy, an innocent participation of traveling along. So, it requires of the reader, much like in the case of the reader of fantasy, an innocent participation or traveling along the path of reading. Uh, unlike fantasy, prophetic writing has um, an eye for unity, however. So, prophet is on a more far off emotional plane while uh, composing. Uh, for example, a note of joy in the prophetic could be so high as to be terrifying uh, and out of the world. So, the joy is so large, the joy is so great, uh, it is so emancipatory that uh, it could be terrifying and ultimately kill one. So, uh, a strong presence of a conscience contracts the effect of a prophetic writer. Uh, so, a prophetic writer is not really led forward by the strong presence of a conscience or any uh, moral yardsticks. I quote uh, E.M. Foster to uh, draw close to our lecture today uh, and uh, draw close to this uh, discussion on prophecy. Foster notes, the human mind is not a dignified organ and I do not see how we can exercise it sincerely except through eclecticism. And the only advice I would offer my fellow eclectics is, do not be proud of your inconsistency. It is a pity. It is a pity that we should be equipped like this. It is a pity that man cannot be at the same time impressive and truthful." Unquote. This implies that the exploration of the human psyche is in fact a difficult, discursive, futile process and it unfurls so many different kinds of oddities which may not give in, which may not, uh, which may not give away very immediately or, or do not uh, succumb to easy pedestrian meanings uh, that uh, comforts the reader. The, the prophetic presence, the fantastic presence could at the most uh, be a game of resilience for the reader, not offer any immediate, uh, you know, uh, comfort or a, a, a reading a niche in the traditional sense. And uh, it might uh, demand of the reader to rework their uh, basic reading skills, the, the kinds of qualities they bring uh, to the table um, while reading the novel, right? With this, I would like to stop our lecture here today and let us meet with a new module and uh, new discussions. Thank you.